Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, it's my pleasure to rise to speak to Bill C-46, uh, the long name and act to amend the National Energy Board Act and the Canada Oil and Gas Operations Act. Uh, the government has chosen to actually name the bill as the Pipeline Safety Act. The measures to increase liability for pipelines are long overdue and very much welcomed. But while welcomed, there are some concerns that the measures may be inadequate, and I'll speak to those inadequacies. Crude oil, petroleum products, natural gas liquids, and natural gas move through 71,000 kilometers of existing interprovincial and international pipelines. That doesn't include the three proposed National Energy Board regulated pipelines. This bill, Mr. Speaker, purports to reinforce the polluter pays principle. It purports to confirm that liability of companies operating pipelines will become, first, unlimited if an unintended or uncontrolled release of oil, gas, or other commodity as a result, is as a result of their fault or negligence. Second, limited liability to a maximum of a billion dollars for pipelines with capacity to transport a minimum of 250,000 barrels of oil per day if there is no proof of fault or negligence. The bill purports to obligate pipeline operators to maintain financial resources necessary to cover potential liability. It also, also purports to authorize the National Energy Board to reimburse government entities for any costs they incur in spill response. It purports to improve responses to abandoned pipelines. That is a new measure. Previously, the National Energy Board was not regulating abandoned pipelines and expands that responsibility um, to inquire into accidents involving abandoned pipelines. It purports to grant discretion in the National Energy Board to require companies to maintain funds for abandoned pipelines. It purports to empower the Cabinet to establish, in certain circumstances, a pipelines claims tribunal, and that tribunal would examine and adjudicate compensation claims. Um, it also authorizes spending to respond to spills, uh, to establish the tribunals, and to pay for compensation awards that are issued by the tribunal. Um, it authorizes the National Energy Board to recover funds paid out by the government as opposed to the, the company. It expands on the polluter pays principle by imposing liability on operators for losses to non-use value of public resources. But it limits the power to the federal crown to pursue those, and there's some concern expressed in how seriously the National Energy Board will pursue that. Mr. Speaker, I wonder if I could interrupt. The minister is having a conversation with one of the members, and I'm having a very hard time even hearing myself talk. I'm wondering if they could ask it to move it outside. Um, I just ask all honourable members. I realize there are several <coughs> several conversations going on in the in the house, and uh, typically, when uh, obviously when a member has been recognized and has the floor, uh, we uh, ask all members' indulgence in uh, bringing their attention to the speaker who has the floor at the moment, which at the moment is the member for Edmonton Strathcona. And so, I would ask again uh, that all members who uh, wish to carry on conversations if they might uh, leave the chamber and carry on outside in their respective lobbies. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Thank Strathcona. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I asked uh, your intervention there because I believe this is a very important piece of legislation and it's important for us to understand what the bill is doing and what it is not yet doing. As I mentioned, uh, Mr. Speaker, the bill expands on the polluter pay principle, a welcome uh, intervention. By imposing liability on operators for losses to non-use value of public resources, but it limits the power to the Federal Crown to pursue compensation for those impacts. And there is some concern that the National Energy Board would not necessarily seriously pursue compensation. It expands the National Energy Board powers to order actions by the companies where there are risks to safety or security of the public, to the company employees, or to the pipeline or abandoned pipelines, and for protection of property or the environment. Yet it may be noted that the recently tabled estimates for the 2015-16 year provide for reductions for the budget for the National Energy Board for the regulation of pipelines contributing to the safety of Canadians and protection of the environment. So, so much for the touted equal attention to supporting resource development and environmental protection. There are going to be no additional resources allocated for the ongoing mandate and no additional resources for the added mandate of the NEB for abandoned pipelines. Natural resources is also apparently being cut by $320 million across the board, 
or 12.6% of its budget. Surely given the potential payouts under Bill C-46, this is not the time to be paying down the deficit on the backs of communities impacted by spills. Confidence will be raised about commitments of this government to address the impacts of it if a contingency fund is set aside. It will become apparent later in the discussion of the bill as taxpayers may be left holding the bag under this law. The Canadian Environmental Protection Agency is also forecast to be cut by 13.6 million or 44 percent of its budget. That's a significant portion. Um, a significant portion of its budget has previously gone to supporting Aboriginal consultation. Uh, many of these pipelines go through First Nation uh, lands, which are already designated uh, as their lands are being claimed. Given the number of resource projects proposed and the fact that the NEB does not adequately deliver on public participation in decision making, it's impossible to understand how the government will fulfill its duty to consult Indigenous peoples and how any project will obtain the social license needed to operate. Yes, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that these budgets may well be supplemented through supplementary estimates. But it is astounding nonetheless that at the same moment we are debating a bill touted to improve pipeline safety, the government tables estimates providing no increased funds to deliver on the expanded man mandates of the National Energy Board, the Tribunal, and for the government to address spill compensation, let alone the coverage of spill costs. This is troubling on a number of fronts. The increased scale of potential risk and impact from majorly increased daily volumes and nature of the products proposed to be piped, in other words, diluted bitumen. First, the Enbridge Gateway Pipeline proposes 525,000 barrels a day. The Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain expansion would add 890,000 barrels a day and the Trans-Canada Energy East Pipeline, if approved, will add 1.1 million barrels a day. One can only hope that the intent is to retroactively apply these higher liabilities for pipelines already approved prior to the passage of this law. It should be triggering significantly enhanced inspection and capacity to respond to breaks and spills as well. This is important given the poor record by the National Energy Board and the pipeline operators in detecting pipeline breaks and spills or in seeking compliance. The majority of pipeline accidents of late in my province of Alberta and in the Northwest Territories have been discovered and reported by and large by citizens or by Aboriginal hunters and trappers out on their lands, not by the National Energy Board or provincial regulatory agencies or by the companies themselves. For example, the Wrigley incident. Um, I had the opportunity, Mr. Speaker, when attending the Dene gathering in uh, Fort Providence a couple of years ago where uh, a hunter um, came to the meeting and revealed that when he was out on the land, um, he was sitting down by a marsh and suddenly a bear appeared. And there didn't seem to be anything he could do to make the ba bear go away. He would scare the bear away and the bear would come back. And so he decided finally that he would go and investigate what is happening with this strange behavior of the bear. What did he discover? He discovered a major break in a pipeline and a massive spill. So there is uh, one example where uh, we, the operators are simply not detecting and reporting requires the people on the land. And we additionally had to step in and demand um, support to the First Nation community who are trying to address the impact of the spill. If we had not done that, the National Energy Board had not stepped forward. Um, <clears throat> secondly, in Alberta, um, I could go on and on about the incidents uh, with pipelines. For example, there was a spill from Plains Midstream Pipeline near Sundry, Alberta into a river, then into a drinking water reservoir. It was not reported to the impacted landowners. In April 2011, the largest pipeline spill in history, again by Plains Midstream, midstream 4.5 million litres of oil uh, spilled northeast of Peace River. That was detected again by the Dene First Nation and uh, not the operator. They ended up having to close the, the school because of, uh, of the fumes from uh, the petroleum. The First Nation was deeply concerned about the impacts to their waters, fish, birds and wildlife that they relied upon and concerned with many abandoned well sites and pipelines. And that of course is an example, uh, Mr. Speaker, that if the First Nations are not able to seek compensation for impacts to the waters, fish, birds and wildlife they rely upon in their habitat, that will be an issue if the government doesn't step up to the plate. And again, I remind this place of the Wobbman derailment and spill. Yes, it was not a pipeline, 
but it took a week for the federal agencies to actually come forward and assist the First Nations who were directly impacted by that incident. So what are some of the concerns that have been identified with the bill? Well, many of the reforms in Bill C-46, um, including expanded powers and new rights, and some additional, um, <coughs> have some additional concerns about them. Well, the reforms are welcomed, including expand expanding to abandoned well sites, uh, expanding uh, liability, increasing liability to one billion. There are some concerns with the way that the bill has been drafted. For example, the adequacy of the upper limit of one billion dollars. Uh, we can all recall the Kalamazoo bitumen spill cost 600 million merely to clean up the spill and that was before any compensation was given to any of the, the communities or property owners who were impacted. Ecojustice has identified that the bill fails to prescribe mechanisms to actually assess the risk, taking into consideration either the type of the material shipped, is it more corrosive? Secondly, the potential for environmental, and I add, or health nap damages. Third, um, an accident or compliance history. And fourth, the age of the line, and I would suggest also the maintenance record. So there is no provision in the bill that actually specifies what is the National Energy Board supposed to consider or the tribunal tribunal once established. Secondly, concerns have been raised about bankruptcy implications. There is a concern that the polluter pay provisions may be superseded in the case of bankruptcy of a pipeline owner and operator as bankruptcy law prevails, and that is something that uh, merits discussion at committee. Third, there's concern with the level of discretion vested in the National Energy Board and in the tribunal, and uh, there appears to be a discretionary, potentially politically influenced process. For example, the company must first be designated um, before the tribunal may, may review. Um, it is also not clear whether or not there's going to be a permanent tribunal and they will simply sit around waiting for uh, a pipeline to be designated or a company designated or whether they will only step forward at the time that there is an incident and compensation claims are required. Um, the, there's also going, only going to occur in the situation where the cabinet in its discretion determines on the recommendation of a minister that a company does not have sufficient resources to pay costs or clean up um, or the company fails to comply with an NEB order. The National Energy Board can then directly reimburse for impacts or the costs incurred and the payment can be directed from a pooled fund. The cost can be recovered as a debt but unlikely of bankruptcy. The tribunals um, are established only, as I said, where a company is designated. In other words, for each incident, not permanently designated. Section 4818, subsection 2, is a little confusing. It states that the government council, in other words, the cabinet, can only establish a tribunal if it's in the public interest, somehow factoring the extent of the compensable damage, and it's unclear if the concern is with too small a claim or very large. The tribunal is granted total discretion in how to notify the public. Um, it's been suggested by a number of parties who have participated in tribunals there should be clear guidance on who is actually supposed to notify the public that they can uh, seek claim for damages and how they would go about doing that. Um, there is also the query of why only the appointment of retired judges. Uh, in many cases in these tribunals it's maybe more appropriate to appoint people with technical background who understand pipelines, understand uh, impacts and so forth. The reason why that issue is raised is because the staffing and expertise for the tribunal is at the discretion of the National Energy Board. There's no certainty that there will be some form of a secretariat with the appropriate expertise to assist the tribunal in its determinations. It is encouraging, Mr. Speaker, that the cabinet may make regulations authorizing the tr tribunal to award fees and travel and other costs for claimants to present their case. But it's, that is going to be by regulation and it's not clear what the timeline is on the issuance of those regulations to set the guidance. Um, it's no, noted that the regulations can fix a maximum compensation but we don't know based on what factors as mentioned earlier. And perhaps it would be a good idea to actually provide criteria for calculating the costs of the impacts. Um, the imposition of fees, levies, charges for payouts um, can be drawn from the Consolidated Revenue Fund. Uh, there is the issue and the concern of how seriously uh, um, the funds will be pursued from the operator or whether there will be reliance on public funds. Uh, the National Energy Board is empowered to issue regulations setting rates, 
There is no mention of, of consultation with either the pipeline operators or the public on how they will set those rates for the levies and fees. It will be important for the National Energy Board to report regularly on its efforts to recover these debts incurred for spill cleanup or compensation. There's no mention in the bill to that effect. Regarding cost advances to file claims, it's unclear if the law is allowing for the payment of advance uh, funds to address a spill or to clean up a spill, or if they're also allowing for advances to uh, people who are seeking compensation to hire lawyers, to hire experts, and so forth. Very important in procedures before a tribunal. <clears throat> so in closing, Mr. Speaker, increasing concerns are being expressed within communities and First Nations with the approach to regulating pipelines arising from failed spill prevention, failed detection, failed response to spills, and the failure of the National Energy Board or other government agencies to require pipeline proponents to disclose their emergency and spill response plans for public review and scrutiny. That certainly has arisen, Mr. Speaker, in the review of the Kinder Mo Mountain proposed expansion. Uh, people there along that line are very concerned that they're not having access to the emergency spill response plan. The same was the case with the Athabasca Chippewyan First Nation uh, with a review of a pipeline in Alberta. They eventually pulled away from an energy board review because they first of all were denied access to that emergency spill response plan for a pipeline and then given less than 24 hours to review the document. The Alexis First Nation in Alberta has also been demanding greater access to information on the spill from breaches of mines. Canadians' preference is the prevention of harm to their communities, to their environment, not mere compensation after the fact. As the expression goes, mieux vaut prévenir que guérir. The improved measures provided under C46 will be welcomed and offer succor to those impacted by major spills. But it is unlikely to be sufficient to restore trust in this government or in the National Energy Board in the wake of denied access to potentially impacted communities and First Nations of emergency spill response plans, the downgrading of federal environmental and fisheries laws, the diminished opportunity for public First Nations to participate in pipeline reviews. Frankly, um, uh, in the National Energy Board and Provincial Energy Reviews, there have been many uh, concerns, concerns raised. I gave the example of uh, this uh, Athabasca Chippewyan First Nation, extremely disturbed where the pipeline was going through the traditional lands. They could not get access to uh, uh, major documents. Um, the change to the National Energy Board intervener rules limit participation. I give the example where the previous Minister of Natural Resources dubbed interveners in the review of pipelines as radical groups threatening to hijack regulatory systems for the radical ideological agenda merely because they sought to intervene to raise concerns with pipeline projects. Concerns have been expressed by the Commissioner for Environment and Sustainable Development in his uh, 2011 report regarding the long-standing failure by Transport Canada and the National Energy Board to ensure compliance or corrective action and the failure by the NEB to review emergency procedures of 39% of regulated companies. Absent increased resources, there's little confidence this will be addressed in a timely manner. Yes, Canadians recognize they rely on fossil fuels for their use and benefit from revenues from sale and export, and that pipelines are needed to transport the fuel. But it's reasonable for Canadians to expect that their government will regulate the sector in a manner that ensures protection of their health and environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.